Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 17th Annual Mental Health Program. Um, we will be talking about narcissism today. We selected this disorder because it seems to be a topic of interest and intrigue for many at this time. We wanted to thank Dr. Cindy Anderson for supporting this event, as well as the psychology department for supporting this event. Um, I also wanted to thank Professor Nick Jesus for um, spearheading the organization and logistics of this event and all prior mental health awareness events. Um, he has been putting events like this together for 17 years. He's such a hard worker and such a pleasure to work with. And last, but definitely not least, I would like to thank Dr. Keith Bjorgi for coming out and speaking to us today. Um, he is the clinical director of Cherry Hill Counseling. He has been a clinical psychologist for 30 years, over 30 years, and an undergraduate and graduate professor of psychology for over 20 years. I'm fortunate enough to have had him as a professor, and he's an incredible and insightful teacher, so I know you are in for a treat. Um, he has special interests in the topics of marital relationships, anxiety, depression, narcissism, narcissistic relationships, and so on. <laughs> Lots of interests. Um, if you have questions, please hold on to them till the end because there will be a Q&A session at that point. If you need to get course credit for this event, there is a sign-in table at the back, so make sure you sign in. And without further ado, I welcome Dr. Keith Bjorki. Thank you, Kara. Um, you're very kind, and it was a delight to have you in class. Um, that's when you start to feel old. You, you see, your, see your students in, um, in their professional uh, environment. Um, I, I want to start by telling uh, a story about myself. It goes back to roughly about 2010. And I got to tell you, it was a life-changing moment for me. Um, it started out as a professional changing moment. But about that time, it was life-changing. Let me back up and give you a little history. I am doing professionally what I never planned to do. I'm doing what I'm doing professionally with people that I never planned to do it with, and I'm loving it. The moral there is, for me, is plan your life, but hold your plans loosely. But if I go back to roughly the late 90s, my transition, I began my career in the late 80s, primarily working with adolescents, problem teens, adolescent substance abusers. And if you work with those individuals, you work with their families. And if you work with their families, you work with the, the parents or the couples. It all comes as a whole package. And I will tell you, given my childhood and my background and growing up in a very dysfunctional home, we didn't even keep the fun in dysfunctional, I said to myself early on in my career, there is no way that I want to work with families or couples. I grew up in that environment. I don't want to work in that environment. And roughly somewhere in the mid-90s, because I'm working with teens, I realize i got to work with these families. And if I'm working with the families, a lot of times these families have marriages that are really struggling. And I've got to work with the marriages too. One thing about me, I absolutely love to learn. And so I went on a quest to say, well, if I'm going to do this, I want to do it well. And so I began to study and do research about how to work with families well, how to work with couples well. Because I don't know about you, if you're working with anything and you want to fix something, you want movement. I don't like it when things start to block me or break down. And pretty much the families... And the couples that I work with, I would get movement. And I would get some traction. I didn't care how slow. I didn't care how fast. I just wanted to see people grow and change. But roughly about 90, 1999, 2000, I began to realize there's a certain type of family dynamic or couple 
that I found very difficult to get movement on. I was blessed during that period of time, roughly about 2005, 2006, to take a sabbatical from the university that I was currently teaching at, and um, I decided to figure out what was going on there. And what I began to discover was that those individuals that had a hard time moving forward struggled with a sense of connection, a sense of bonding, if you will, that is formed by empathy. So today I want to talk to you about, if you will, struggles with empathy. And one particular type, though I'm going to identify along the way another particular type. And when I thought about this talk, and Kara and I were interacting, what would I call this? What would I call this? And she and I were batting around all different kinds of titles for, for this talk. I decided on narcissism, be aware. I could have said narcissism, <laughs> beware, because they're pretty, it's a pretty scary bunch. But I want you to leave here, as opposed to being aware and being cautioned, I want you to have knowledge in three things, okay? So my talk is broken into three different categories. One is, I want you to know, how do you know? How do we know a narcissist? How can we identify a narcissist? Okay, once you identify a narcissist, what's the problem? What, in essence, is the core to the problem? And the final thing I want you to realize or to reflect upon is what do you do? So how do you know? What is the problem? And what do you do? In that last section, I'm really going to divide that into two categories. I'm very briefly going to talk about what we do as professionals, what you might do, and what you might do as a non-professional. Now, I have so much information in my head, I could talk about this for an entire semester. But my philosophy is, is this, I got 20 minutes and I'm gonna lose you. Okay. So I've gotta hold you here. That's why I wanted to break it into three sections so I can go do 20 minute sec sections. And the other thing that you need to understand is, maybe you find this in your classes here at this university, but two weeks after you had the class, you don't remember much of what you learned anyway. <laughs> you don't. You forget it. What helps you remember things is the sense of doing it over and over and over again. So my students would say to me, how do you remember this stuff? Well, I teach it every semester. It's really kind of hard to forget. So let's dive into this. First, how do we know? Does anybody recognize this? You, what is it? Yeah. It is. He, is. he is correct. It's a 1975 AMC Pacer. Did anybody in here have one? No. Okay. What's my point in bringing up a Pacer? If you right now went out and bought a 1975 AMC Pacer, the car salesman would likely tell you, you know what? This is the only one in the air. This is the only one in Illinois. In fact, in all of the United States of America, there's only like a 1,000 that are currently on the road. And you're thrilled to have this car. I'd advise you not to buy this car. It did not have a good reputation, right? But you buy this car and you drive it off the lot and you go about a mile or two and guess what you see? What do you see? Well, not, well, yeah, you probably see the, you probably see the check engine light, but you see another pacer. In fact, you see a yellow pacer and you're like, Oh my gosh, what is it? You drive a little further down the road. You see another AMC pacer and another AMC pacer. And all of a sudden you begin to think, is that salesman lying to me? What is going on here? What's going on here is a, a phenomenon called the Bader-Meinhof phenomena or effect. As shrinks, I like to call myself, we call this the frequency bias or the coincidence bias. Now, here's what's important about this. It's likely true, I don't know the statistics on AMC Pacers, that there are only 1,000 in the entire country, and maybe only four in the state of Illinois, which you just happen to see. But here's one thing I want you to take away. In life, you find what you seek. 
So if you're looking for something, you're going to find it. If in your brain is a 1975 yellow AMC Pacer, you're going to find one. Why is this important for us? Because currently in our culture, and I kind of blame us mental health professionals, we see narcissism everywhere, all over the place. Granted, we are seeing a spike in a rise in the prevalence of narcissism in the last roughly, say, uh, 12, 13, 14 years, but it ain't everywhere. The incident, the prevalence of narcissism is roughly uh, anywhere from zero to 6%, depending on the statistics you look. I thought that was kind of interesting as I was reviewing the literature, 0%. But it's really about the populations they assess and evaluate. So they can go into some communities and not find it at all. And they go in other communities and they find it up to 6%. The DSM points at a prevalence rate of about 1.6. So let's, what does that mean? That, that really, if you think about it, there are roughly one to two people, every 100 people, that are narcissists. Even if we go to 6%, we would say there's 6 out of 100. There's not 70 out of 100 or 50 out of 100. So this is what's important here. Now, the Bader-Meinhof effect, those aren't researchers. That's actually a group in Germany called the Red Army Faction. And a, and a journalist in St. Paul, Minnesota, came across that group called the Bader-Meinhof Group, the Red Army Faction. And he saw, all of a sudden, he sees Bader-Meinhof all over the place. And they did some research. And we do have a way of orienting our brain to find what we're seeking. So think about that for a moment as you go forward. But the prevalence rate is roughly somewhere, I would say, about 2 to 3%. Best guess. Let's average it out. Okay. So I got a little line up here. The other thing you need to understand is that when we talk about this, how do we know, is that narcissism is on a continuum. I will guarantee whether you're sitting way in the back or you're right up here up front, somewhere in your life, you've had some narcissistic tendencies or traits. In fact, I think you probably should. Because if we follow the golden rule, you should love your neighbor, keyword, as yourself. Not less than yourself and not more than yourself, as yourself. So there should be an aspect of, of loving yourself. This graph is really, this, this line here is really taking off the MCMI. And if you know the Milan Clinical Multi-Axle Inventory, that roughly when you get to a BR score, think statistics. Okay, you probably, I just probably turned you all off. I said statistics, the social scientists. Went, I loved it. But think of base rate scores as T-scores or statistical scores that roughly 75% of people who score in a particular way on the MCMI, which is that, uh, that um, yellow arrow, thank you, I need you, you stay right there. Um, we would call that clinically significant. The blue star is roughly a score of about 60 uh, I'm sorry, 75, the arrow is 85, that now we're saying you got traits. So the bottom line is we have to see narcissism on a continuum, and um, it's, it's, we all have traits. So what's the, I'm going to give you two hallmarks to begin with, with personality disorders in general. Okay, you may not recognize this place, but to me, that's home. And I go back there, oh, about at least every other month. Uh, you can't see, that's the Mississippi River. And that's a dam that I grew up near. And I gotta tell you, that dam has been that way. That river has looked like that throughout history. And no matter what picture I see or where I go, it looks the same. So two key characteristics that you have to understand about personality disorders is they have to be chronic and pervasive. So the fact that you had a trait when you were 18 or 25 or 3 doesn't make you a narcissist. In fact, the old DSM said don't even diagnose personality disorders till about 18. And I think that there's real wisdom in there, even today. 
but it's chronic. It means it, is, it's, it has existed across an extended period of time, and it's per pervasive no matter where you go. So a skunk is a skunk across time and in any location. But not every black and white animal is a skunk, is my point. So we're going to talk a little bit more in clarifying when you can begin to identify how you know. Here's one thing you can take away. I believe that in personality disorders, it's in the wake. It's in the wake of their relationships. So it's not just one person with a, a, a typical kind of wound with a, with a narcissist. It's many people. They have, they have a, a wake of damage of relationships that have existed across an extended period of time. I've worked with narcissists that have said they, things like, I've sued six of my business partners. You should say, to quote Apollo 13, Houston, I, we have a problem, <laughs> right? You know, I've been married five times, all my spouses. We would say, what's the common denominator? You. <laughs> so the wake really has two aspects of the damage. One is you see all this relational damage, and it's really very consistent. The other piece is their own personal functioning. They can't function. Narcissists have a tendency to only function and, and identify themselves in the feedback they receive. You strip that off from them, they really don't even know who they are very well. So, we need the DSM-5 TR. You should be somewhat familiar with that as students and as professionals. If I back up to the DSM-4, to the DSM-5, to the DSM-5 TR, there was a significant debate in the personality section of the DSM. If you read the backstories, they wanted to move away from a categorical model to a dimensional model. In a very nice section now, in Appendix 3 of the DSM-5, they are now implementing, and I think you'll see it in the DSM-6, become more of the diagnostic criteria than the categorical model. We're looking at personality disorders on a dimension, in short. And we're looking across two different sets of domains and domains within those domains. But right now, as it stands, this is the criteria for narcissism. <clears throat> you need five of the nine of these chronically and pervasively as evidenced by damage in relationships across time to be classified by a shrink as a narcissist. Now I think we can really propose and break these down into five key words. These words, in my opinion, are enhancement, enchanted, exploitive, entitled, and zero empathy. And I think we can take each of these and put them in a specific category. You ready? Where might we put grandiose sense? Enhancement is I'm big, I'm important. You look at me, I'm wonderful. They get a blue ribbon, participant ribbon, and they treat it like this glorious thing. They've won the Olympics. Enchanted means I can't suffer. All my suffering is everybody else's fault. You know, you need to tend to me. My life needs to be wonderful. There is no suffering in this world for me. And I believe that suffering is not optional. Your option to suffering is what, you can, what you're going to do with it. Either you're going to be bitter or better. Either you're going to be a victim or a victor but we're all gonna go through hardship. But the, the, the narcissist has to be enchanted, there's no suffering. They're exploited, they manipulate, they play with people. They're entitled, it's mine, I get to do this here. You know, it doesn't matter, I should be able to speed, get out of my way, this is my right of way. And the last thing uh, is zero empathy. So, where do you think number one should go? Entitled, you think so? I put it up there in enhance. Now I will tell you that in my opinion, I, I wrestled with this, this in, um, enhanced and, in, and enchanted. I think we could really put that as one concept. But I put that grandiosity, they need to amplify themselves, be really important. 
They're preoccupied with a success and power. You with me and going with enhanced? Okay. Believe that I'm special and I only associate with the elite. I can't deal with riffraff in life. Oh, those lowly people, those poor people, I can't deal with them. I would put that in the, in the enchanted category. Now, all of these, can be, we can really debate these things, uh, particularly these first four. Enhance, excessive need for demand and admiration. Oh, everyone needs to applaud me. You need to like me. Aren't I wonderful? Aren't I great? I'm acting like a vulnerable narcissist, which I'll mention a little later, rather than you need to applaud me, you need to affirm me. That's clearly enchanted. I need to be wonderful. Entitled, makes sense. Let's put that over there in the title. Exploitive, um, so exploited. Lack of empathy, obviously zero empathy. Envious of others and believes others are envious of them. Put that up there in Enchanted. And I've obviously arrogant and haughty. Now, all that being said, what we're left with are, I think, five key important words. So I talked about the marks or the hallmarks, chronic and pervasive, the wake of damage in relationships, what would people say about them? Is there a repeated history of numerous people that are saying something bad about them? That's the wake in relationship. Or what do they say about their personality? And these five characteristics, they're extremely enhanced. They have to be amplified. They can't have any hardship in life. It's got to go great and wonderful. They are exploited exploitive, they like to manipulate, play with people to get their gains because they're entitled. They have the right. Get away from me. Get, I get this. I remember reading uh, uh, about a, um, an, a famous actor. Um, I'm not saying he's a narcissist. Ask me about the uh, Barry Goldwater rule uh, later if, you, if you're interested. And um, he, go, he, he lives in L.A., and he'll go into restaurants that are no smoking and just smoke. And he just says, because I am who I am, and I can smoke wherever I want to smoke. He's obviously entitled. And then zero empathy. Okay, so those, the hallmarks, the characteristics. Now, I don't like complicating things. I really like to simplify things. So, got the hallmarks. You've um, now got the characteristics. What gets complicated is there are many types patterns, expressions of narcissists. Probably the most, oops, the most um, peculiar is this one down here with the lady who's pulling the hoodie or the, uh, the V-neck uh, or the uh, turtleneck up over her head. That is what we would call, the better word is a vulnerable narcissist. <clears throat> There are, I, I will give a list here of the many different types of, uh, and patterns of narcissism. And you can look at the literature. There's just a, a number of them, a plethora of them. But the vulnerable nar narcissist has a low self-esteem. They're very self-focused. They're, they're uh, very well-defended, extremely insecure, don't want the limelight. But they have this philosophy. It's really all about them. No one suffers like me. You know, you don't know the troubles I've seen. Oh, would that hurt you? Oh, you should see what, can I tell you what happened to me? It's all about them in a very vulnerable and broken way. And if you don't give them the attention, they become passive aggressive. It's not like an avoidant personality who really fears relationships. They fear not getting the attention, not getting the limelight. <clears throat> but the many other types... I'll just mention a few here. If you want to write a couple down, we can talk about them later. Is the unprincipled. Um, I'm going to bring up a little history here because I think this politician was an unprincipled narcissist. Now, some of you are thinking this is more recent. But no, I'm going back to 1970s. Okay? In fact, I'm going to go back to about 1977 when the, the then disgraced president, Richard Nixon, was interviewed by David Frost. And David Frost, a British uh, journalist, finally nailed him. And said, you, basically, he said, you broke the law. And Nixon, without a beat, said, well, I was president. I, 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 I was president. I get to do this. And Frost really stepped into it. You can YouTube it and said, wait a minute. Because you're president? 
you get to violate the law? And Nixon basically said, yes, I do. That's my right as president. No, it's not. We have more recent politicians that have done similar things. That whatever, the, the rule that's out there, they get to break because of the status that they're in. The compensatory narcissist is like a little chihuahua. Anybody got a chihuahua? Okay. Those little dogs have this way when you, if you're, if you're like a, a stranger and you come in their house, they like, they like bark and they, I don't know, this is my associate, and they growl. And it's got little dog disease. I think it's compensating for its smallness. It's so afraid that it's going to get squashed like a bug. I look at this little dog and said, you can't hurt me. Meanwhile, if you ever meet a great Dane, they just look at you and say, could I sit on your lap? So compensatory narcissist is compensating for this inner sense deep down inside of their brokenness, their shame. Often common. Amorous. These are the lovers. These are their charmers. These, they like to woo you in. They use empathy for, for their gain. They know how to just pull you in, but they pull you in in a way that just manipulates you. The elitist. Um, these people, they're not compensatory narcissists. True story. Uh, I'll make a comment now about uh, later in a slide. The one thing that's unique about narcissists is that they own it. I'll say a little bit more about that later. They own it. When they truly understand narcissists, they go, yep, that's me. I'm a narcissist. Um, and so I had a guy once that I was working with that said, I said, it's almost as if, because I call them out nicely. I'm not rude. I said, it's almost like, you know, um, and this guy was a, a religious person. You know, God, in, in the Psalms, it says, God made man a little lower than the angels. And my sense is with you, God made the angels, God made man, and God made you right in between. He literally took his right hand, slapped his left shoulder, and said, that's me. They truly believe in an elite status. The fanatic is paranoid, scared, highly amplified, and then Milan talks a little bit about a normal. I don't like the word normal at all. You know, I like the words usual and customary. Um, abnormal implies abnormal, and I fit more in that category than the normal category. Um, but I like to think the more moderate than the more functioning. Either way, the problem with all of these individuals, as we get into it here, is zero empathy. <clears throat> They, at the core, whether it's enchanted, whether it's entitled, whether it's enhanced, um, whether it's uh, exploitive, they can't feel for other people. It's unrequited love. You're loving someone who will not love you in return. That's not how relationships are supposed to work. It's supposed to go back and forth. So... I'm going to tell you a little bit about zero empathy here. I'm taking from Simon Baron Cohn. If you're going, hey, wait a minute. There's a Sasha Baron Cohn. You're right. They're actually cousins, <laughs> which I found kind of interesting. But in his research, looking at evil in particular and zero empathy, here's what's interesting about uh, two types of people who struggle with empathizing with feeling for other people. We have narcissists, and we typically have autistic people. And Mike, if I go back to my clinical work, the people I had a hard time moving forward in, in forming better bonded relationships were people who struggled with empathy. And I really found, as I and then dove more into the research, it's either that they're on the spectrum autistically, or they're narcissistic. Now, narcissists cognitively can understand feelings. They can see someone in pain, but they don't care to do anything about it. In fact, I call it, they step over feelings. If, some, if you were to fall down on the sidewalk in front of a narcissist, they would step right over you, or worse, they would curse you or blame you. Don't fall down in front of me. Get out of my way. What are you, idiot? They'll step right over you. They don't care. Autistic people, on the other hand, have this incredible desire to want to help. 
but they can't read the room. They don't know what to do. They get overstimulated, and they, you start to see them freak out and get anxious because they don't know what to do, and they really want a concrete, I'm telling you, like hug them. Look them in the eye. Say, I'm sorry. And I will tell you, there'll be Johnny on the spot to do it. I'm sorry. You hurt? Let me give you a hug. Now, the hug might feel stilted. They want to do something, but they just can't read the, the dynamics of the relationship. So what we do with autistic people is literally give them step-by-step -step instructions. When you meet this person or a new person, this is what you do. Narcissists, on the other hand, in my experience, and I, I will talk to them about it, did you see that person's pain? You seem to step right over it. In fact, as you stepped over it, you seem to get angry with them as you did. And they will acknowledge that they did. Now, this sounds awful, right? Say, yeah. It sounds awful. Who in their right mind would ever get in a relationship with someone who has no empathy, only enhances themselves, wants to live an enchanted life, exploits people, um, and has no sense of empathy for me. Well, no one in their right mind, if on the back, you know, we had this little surgeon uh, general or psychological warning label and said, warning, narcissist. Relating this person could be hazardous to your health. Wouldn't that be nice? You could turn the person around and read that. That's not the case. Many, many, many people fall in love with a narcissist. You likely would, too. Even if you're sitting there saying, there's no way in God's green earth that I would ever do that. I'm telling you, there is a risk. Well, why? Because narcissism, psychopathologically, isn't as obvious as, say, paranoid schizophrenia. If you see someone who's paranoid schizophrenic and they're actively hallucinating, you would say, oh my goodness, sad. They have a lot, they've lost their grip on reality. They must have some sort of psychotic disorder. No, narcissism is not obvious. In fact, it's the opposite. These individuals can be incredibly charming. They can be incredibly wooing. They know how to pull you right in. In fact, even though I'm talking about zero empathy, I would postulate and I believe narcissists have the capacity to empathize, but they won't. It's not an inability. It has to go this way. It's not going to go bidirectionally. So what they will do is they will use that empathy to woo you in, to 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 secure a relationship. They'll love bomb you. They'll groom you. They, they, will, they will see those weaknesses and they'll just slowly pull you in. And you get deep into the relationship before you ever realize, oh my good. I'm talking months. Months into the relationship before you realize, oh my gosh, I'm trapped. I got to get out of here. And the person will continue to manipulate you to orchestrate, to keep you in the relationship and convince you that everybody in the world is bad and wrong and against me and against us and it's you and me, babe, against the world and we all want to be chosen. So hearing the word, I chose you and you know me, I would only choose the best. Doesn't that feel good? So you don't catch the hook. So we get involved in a relationship. On top of the fact, when you fall in love, your brain releases a, do, uh, a hormone called, a uh, chemical called dopamine, and it makes you stupid. <laughs> and it causes you to chase things that you ought not to chase. Cocaine addicts will talk about the chase of getting the cocaine and then the release before they even use cocaine once they have the cocaine in possession. It's the chase. When you hear that phone ding, ding, that's dopamine going like, look at me, chase me. That's dopamine. And it just pulls you in and makes you stupid. On top of the fact, when you look at someone in the eye, I'm looking at you, I'm looking at you, or you touch someone's hand and you get close to them, your brain releases a hormone called oxytocin. It's a bonding hormone. 
So when we look at each other, we touch each other. And if you're sexually intimate with each other, your brain just floods with this bonding hormone that connects you to the person. And then serotonin, it releases serotonin that makes you feel so good. So falling in love is like a drug disorder that makes you stupid on top of the fact you've got this manipulative, enhanced individual that's using all that chemistry and all that empathy to woo you in, damn, you're doomed. So I want to say this from a perspective that anybody in this room, anybody, that if you've been groomed and sucked in by a narcissist, it is not your fault. Don't ever blame, as a professional, the one who was groomed. Moms will often do that out of protection. Well, why did you do that? Why did you, don't you know better? No, not at the moment I didn't. And help mom understand all this because if, when she does, she'll come on the other side. Oh my, oh my gosh, I'm blaming you for all this. So that's how we fall in love. And you would fall in love with a narcissist. But why in the bee deep would you stay? That's just dumb. Now, many of you have heard the term gaslight right? If you've not seen the movie, I highly recommend you see the movie. Because I find, um, you guys are going to say, like, this guy's really a nerd. I've seen the movie more than once because I'm absolutely fascinating on how uh, Ingrid Bergman, her name is Paula in the movie, is affected repeatedly by gaslighting with the with the peep the victims if you will or the partners of narcissists when they sit in my office i see the same pattern so in essence gaslighting is this process by your interacting with an individual that makes you sick they make you the problem and eventually like anything in life i think politicians got this down to an art form that if you say something repeatedly enough, people begin to believe it. They, be, they, they begin to wonder, wow, well, maybe that is true. Um, maybe that is the fact. But it's not. It's not based in reality. It's not based in truth. And there's a scene in the movie where Paula eventually realized, oh my gosh, all this stuff that's going on to me. And you just see her psychology erode. And she, she becomes incredibly insecure and she doubts herself. And then someone comes in and gives her an alternative perspective and the movie begins to shift. So, in essence, that whole exploited behavior begins to web you in a way that keeps you in the relationship. There are a handful of patterns here I can identify. One is the pleaser. The pleaser is the one who I need to make sure that he's happy. It's my job to make this him happy. The victim in, in, in a narcissistic relationship. She's like, life is so dangerous. It really is. I need a big, strong person like you. You know, that's Piglet. <laughs> um, the martyr feels that their purpose in life is to suffer. They have a higher call. I tied the, the martyr a little bit with the, um, 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 the therapist missionary. The, the, I suffer. It, I, life is just filled with suffering. And for whatever reason, I got a mark on my life that I'm just to suffer. Woe is me. So I guess I'll stay with you because this is my lot in life. And the missionary or the therapist takes this one step further, and it's like therapy dating or missionary dating. I'll change him. You know, I'll love the narcissism right out of him. I'll squeeze him and hug him so much he'll change. Um, I got to tell you if, you, if you ever hear something like this, a good woman will stay by the side no matter how much he lies or she and cheats. Say this to them. That's true. It's your mother. Go home. <laughs> the bottom line is, these are unhealthy relationships. And even if someone says that, yeah, there might be someone, it might be your mother and you should go home. So now we know. We got the hallmarks. We got the characteristics. And if we're talking about relationships, we can see the effects upon individuals when they get involved in these relationships. Now, what in the world do we do with these individuals? 
Um, the first thing I want to say to you, is, I've, which I've already uh, said, is um, I like this. You know, I guess I'd probably feel worse about n uh, being a narcissist if, if I wasn't so darn perfect. Um, here's the problem. I get this. I'm going to answer the question before it comes out. You can ask again. I'll answer it in the same way. So if you want to hear it twice, ask me and I'll say it again. People say, can narcissists change? Yes. Wrong question. The problem with narcissism is it's an ego syntonic problem. I have attached earlobes. If you said, hey, you got attached earlobes. I'd say, yeah, I do. Not a problem. Some people have them, some people don't. Narcissism, it matches their ideal. In fact, there was a study done that took narcissi the narcissistic personality in, in, uh, inventory down to one question. And they called it the single inventory narcissist scale. Um, I have it here somewhere. Um, here's the question. In narcissists, the vast majority of them would answer yes to this. To what extent do you agree with this statement? I am a narcissist. And you have to put the note in there. You have to put the little parenthetical note in there. The word narcissist means egotistical, self-focused, self-focused and vain. The vast majority of narcissists said, that's me. So the problem here in working with narcissists, both clinically and non-professionally, is you're dealing with somebody who is really quite comfortable with the problem. So what do we need to do to help them understand this is a problem? Okay, and I'm going to kind of highlight some things here in a moment for professionals. We can, I can certainly spend much more time on that. Um, but I got to tell you, um, May will be the 36th year I've been in clinical practice. Boy, that makes me feel old. And I got to tell you, this is really true. And one of the things I need to do is help them understand the wake of the problem. And I've had very very few narcissists change in the years that I've been doing this. I have them, though, in a very unique way. You might argue that their character kind of stays intact and they're still somewhat self-absorbed, but they've learned in some capacity to hold and secure a relationship and empathically connect with people. But what's interesting to me is when I look at them, and I remember reading this, that personality disorders seem to wane as people age. I'm pressing my brain, but I can't remember one narcissist that I worked with that wanted to change their narcissism that was under 50 years of age. I find that interesting. So the point here is that it's extremely rare. I'm going to uh, give it, kind of lay out some things here in a moment in terms of um, what we need to do to help people uh, change. But I'm going to assure you that they can change. Um, and what we need to do here is we need to kind of set up a way. And I'm going to just kind of outline some things just briefly. Uh, I can give a commercial to the Chicago Center for EFT. He's going to talk a little bit more about this in about a month or so if you're interested. But if we have treatment objectives, we need to go back to kindergarten to help narcissists do what? Play in the sandbox. Get along with people. <laughs> we need to teach them how to share. So these are just treatment goals and objectives. So if the world is a great big giant sandbox, we all folks, I don't care who you are, where you come from, we all need to learn to play in this big sandbox a little better. So we need to share our, 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 our toys. We need to connect with each other, see that we belong to each other. We need to understand the impact of your behavior upon other people. Listen, you are constantly influencing people, whether you like it or not. You are constantly being influenced by people. Do you ever reflect upon, am I happy with the influence I'm having on people? Am I okay with that? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? If you do reflect upon it, I'd argue to say you're not a narcissist. Let's flip this. 
you are constantly being influenced by people. Namely, it's your relationships. Are you happy with that influence? Are you pleased with how they're positively or ne negatively impacting you? And if you're not, you can make a change. The bottom line is, do you have an understanding of your impact? And we need to help narcissists understand the impact, the wake of those damaging relationships. We need to teach them how to express the empathy that they see. Stop stepping over people. You know, stop, pick them up, feel for them. Feel and express a genuine sense of remorse. Consider the needs of others. Get to your vulnerable feelings. That's key. In terms of self-functioning, can you accept yourself who you are? Okay, I'm going to say something. This comes from a guy by the name of W. Keith Campbell, wrote a very, very interesting book probably about 10 years ago called The Narcissistic Epidemic. He says in the book, children don't need to know they're special. Children need to know they're loved. It's not about being special. Why we want to make people special is so they think if I'm special, I will get the affection that I so long for. No, that's not how it works. We love them, and it's in the love that you have for them that makes them special. You love your children, or you love your partner, or you love your grandchildren just because they're there. They're yours. So accept yourself who you are in terms of a goal, um, objective. Um, decrease the need for affirmation. And, and again, identify those close, intimate feelings. Now, uh, this is, this is, this is, the, I'm, I'm going to break this. Now, what do we do into two parts? This is for the professional. Um, and, and then um, I'm going to say something for the non-professional. So if you were ever in a relationship with a narcissist or you find yourself now in a relationship with a narcissist, I'm going to give you basically two uh, kind of guidelines to help you with that. But th th the bottom line here is that when you're with a narcissist, one of the things you're going to have to do professionally is control your counter-transference. So if I go back to my story, and I'm thinking of the couples that I worked with, where one is particularly a narcissist, and I got to tell you, I don't like them. There's, there's something in me. When I see someone adversely hurting and wounding and manipulating and exploiting someone else, it just gets the dander up in me. And I want to say to the non-narcissist, get out. <laughs> but that's not what I should do at that point in time. Um, so managing first your counter-transference is key because you have to build rapport. Now, I'm going to tell you it's not real hard to build rapport with a narcissist because they come in and they like the affirmation, so when you affirm them in therapy, they're going to wind up staying in therapy because they like hearing about it. But if you look at narcissism on the continuum, at its core is that difficulty getting to really vulnerable emotions. So they're really hard to work with. They're very defended when you get close to those wounds, they want to back away. They want to push away. They don't like the confrontation, and you need to hold them there. Listen, if you're a therapist or you want to be a therapist, you have a choice. You either can help your clients or your patients feel better or be better. And sometimes I need to talk to people and have a difficult conversation so they can be, be better rather than feel better. And it's in the empathy and the rapport that I do and how I create that. So I want you to think like if you go in for physical therapy and you had surgery on your leg and they're trying to increase your range of motion on that leg, and the physical therapist will do what? Begin to grab that leg and, and start to stretch it until it hurts, right? Been there, done that, right? And you go, ha. Ah. And, and they're attuned to you. They have the rapport with you. And they say, does that hurt? You say, yes. Let's hold it right there. 
Let's hold right there. If that professional just makes it easy for you, they're not going to grow. That range of motion isn't going to get better. A good therapist will press into that vulnerability and hold that person there until the range of motion, if you will, the pain is processed. This is extremely difficult with a narcissist because for many of them, when you understand what happened to them, all of a sudden you begin to say, oh my God, I can see why maybe they developed this rigid defensiveness. So you're building rapport. The other thing you're doing is you're identifying patterns of behavior. This is what you do that perpetuates your problem and creates this, these wakes of relational damage and, and functioning in your life that's problem, problematic. I'll say it bluntly to you, but you're helping them painfully understand that they're the common denominator, not these people. And these patterns of behavior that you do are, are the means by which you're repeating the common denominator. So getting to the vulnerability is key. And then getting them to express, uh, uh, accept it and express it is vital for the change. What deep down inside do they feel? And how could they express that in their con uh, in a relational context that gets them what they want? It's okay to want to be affirmed. It's okay to turn to your partner and say, do I look good in this? Yeah, babe, you do. Do I look good in this, honey? No, that shirt doesn't look so good on you. Change it. Um, we all want that. How did I do on this? Are you pleased? Um, it, marks in class, maybe. It's, we all want to be affirmed and needed. So getting them to identify that those vulnerable feelings and express that, uh, accept that and express that's where change really happens when it takes forever to get there I call that the later stages of therapy. I'm just simplifying as best I can uh, but when you get them there It's almost like magic on the couch Between people when you get them to those vulnerable places and They accept it and their partner accept it. It's like just step back and watch the magic happen it's really quite remarkable. So that's it in, in, in a nutshell. Um, how do you respond as non-professionals? How many of you have ever heard the term gray rocking? Got one, yeah, yeah, a few people. Um, I'm gonna, for, for many of you then, it's um, in the world, in the narcissistic world, and people who work with narcissistic abuse and people who've gone through narcissistic abuse, um, this is a concept that is fairly popular in that circle right now, and I'd like you to get familiar with it. The rule of thumb in dealing with a narcissist is don't deal with a narcissist, okay? All said and good, right? The way that I frame that is whenever you're around a narcissist, interact with them as little as possible. Stay away as much as you possibly can. If, you're, you don't, if, you don't, if you don't have to be uh, volunteer to be in a project or a relationship with them, don't volunteer, don't go there, don't be in the relationship with it because it's going to wind up being toxic to you. But that's not always possible. It could be a colleague at work that you have to work with. It could be a parent. It could be a child in your family. Um, it, it could be a boss. You might have someone in your life. And if the statistics are right... We put it between two and three, so two or three out of 100. You know more than 100 people. I'll guarantee you, in your life, you have a narcissist with whom you're relating to. So, but when you can't stay away, gray rocking is this become uninteresting, become unengaging, become boring, become bland. One of the things that narcissists constantly need is to feed their ego via the affirmation. So when they light up the fireworks, or they buy someone flowers, and they want the applause, and they want the affirmation, you be like toast without butter. Oh, nice. So unengaging, boring. Um, and what happens with narcissists, when they lose their supply, they move on. They will stop coming to you for that affirmation. They'll go elsewhere. But some of you, sadly, 
have been in narcissistic relationships and wounded and hurt. I can feel the pain. I've seen it on my couch. I will tell you that narcissistic abuse is a complex trauma. It's not like, you know, a, a car accident. And a trauma is trauma, and you witness a car accident, you're in a car accident out there, it's a one-time event, it's, it's simple. It's not simple, it's tragic, but that's the event that caused the trauma. It's something that exists across a, a period of time and is so complex because you were groomed, you were pulled in, you were a manipulative, you believed in what they said. If you are a victim of narcissistic abuse and you experience this complex trauma, I encourage you to get trauma-informed treatment. There are some solid therapeutic approaches today that really work well with trauma. EMDR, prolonged exposure therapy, cognitive-informed um, trauma therapy. Um, EFT has shown some results, emotionally focused, emotion focused, um, uh, internal family systems. But if you go see a therapist, ask them, what is your experience in trauma-informed treatment? Don't see a generalist. See someone who's clearly informed in, in that, that form of therapy. So for you individuals, and all of us who have a narcissist in their life, you're going to have to get boring. You're going to have to get unexciting. You're going to have to gray rock. And, and if you did suffer with this, then I would strongly encourage you to get into some therapy. Now, I want to go back to the beginning here. So I told you I had a life-changing moment. Some of you have maybe forgotten it. Some of you wonder, like, is he ever going to get to that life-changing moment that he had? That he, you know, he's talking about, yes, I am. I want to end there. <clears throat> so if I go back to, you know, somewhere um, around 2010, and I'm working with these couples with whom there is a narcissist. And one of the things that I will do is I will call the narcissist out. For you professionals out there, what this looks like is I will very compassionately go over the criteria of narcissism. I will talk about it with them. They will say that, yes, I do that. Yes, I do that. Yes, I do that. Then I'll come in very kindly and say, this is really narcissistic. Let's look at this. Let's look at this in light of the history of your relationships. And I've had some in my office say, oh, my God, that's why my kids won't talk to me. Oh, my God, it's me in all those marriages. Now, they begin to want to make changes because we're, we're beings that need to pair bond. We want to pair bond. And they want to have a secure relationship. And so along the way, they're learning ways to empathize and feel and form safe and secure relationships and be that safe and secure person. But I had the hardest time getting to the point of realizing that. And I'm working with these couples, and I, got, I, I made my confession. I don't like them. You know, I've had one narcissist almost across my entire lifespan. I've loved them, and I've hated them both at the same time. And I'm studying narcissism, and I got a book by a guy by the name of Bruce Perry. Anybody heard of that name? No? Called Born for Love. And I get in the book and I read 10 pages into the book. And I read this quote by a lady by the name of Mary Gordon. And I want to say a little bit about Mary Gordon here, it says. Because I'm thinking, like, how do I get through to these guys? How do I, how do I break it down to help them form these relationships? And I read this in the book, and it made me so angry. I remember the office that I was in, the desk I was sitting in, and I had a strong, emotional, painful response. I pushed the book away. I said, no, I'm not doing that. And I was convicted that the only way that people learn narcissists, I think Mary Gordon is right, I believe that successful people develop empathy from receiving it and witnessing it. And I went, Oh my gosh, I got to get them. I've got to understand them. 
I've got to get to the vulnerability that I talked about earlier, way down deep inside with these narcissists. And when I'm in relationships, I need to model it. I need to get up on an upper level and say, this is what I'm doing with her. This is what I'm doing with him. I'm empathizing. I'm feeling with them. What's this like for you? Do you notice that you just step over them? Yeah, I did. I just stepped over them. Those that want to change. So yeah, I just stepped right over those feelings. What do you feel when you turn back and you look at me? Boy, they fell over. You didn't cause it. And you step over. I, I kind of feel bad. Oh, can we stay right there? I'm holding the pain. That's what I call that right remorse. That's okay. It tells me you have a conscience deep down inside. Can you feel that pain? This was a life-changing moment for me. Um, to read that book, get so angry, and realize, okay, the seed, the way, the avenue, the conduit by which we as human beings experience connection, bonds, if you will, love, is an empathy. And I think Bruce Perry in this book, too, he said, empathy underlies virtually everything that makes society work. I think he's right. Fred Rogers, listening is, is where love begins. It's stopping. It's not just listening. It's feeling. It's getting the emotion. It's getting underneath it, not just to our neighbors, but to ourselves. So in all of this, the change for me, whether they're narcissists or not, now I'm going to tell you, I'm still going to say to you, you don't have to like them. You don't want to have to, you don't, don't be around them. But you may at times need to express empathy for them. You may at times need to express some care for them, if you will, even love for them, while you're protecting yourself. So guard yourself, be careful, but do be empathic. And if you work with them professionally, it's the incredible test. It takes years of therapy, sometimes multiple times a week, to get them through those resisted blocks to that vulnerable change where they do make a change. It's not very common because they don't see the need. But I want you, all of us here, to be the good in the world. I want us all to be that connection of empathy in the world. Thank you for your time. Go out there and be the good in the world. Thanks. So we're going to do question and answers. Yes, Dr. Bjorge, thank you very, very much yeah, for a sure. novel presentation. Can we give him another hand? Thank you. thank you. We're going to open up this segment for the next 15 minutes to ask Dr. Bjorge questions. Uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand. We'll give you the mic. And uh, Dr. Holfack, Dr. Bjorge can address your question. All the way in the back. Okay. Meet me in back. Hi, did you talk about the Barry Goldwater rule? No, I didn't. I didn't. Um, so uh, the Goldwater rule, um, um, I was just a kid at the time, so I'm not that old. Barry Goldwater ran for president, I believe, in 1964. And the American Psychiatric Association came out with a statement that said, Barry Goldwater is not fit to be president. He did not win the presidency, sued the American Psychiatric Association, and won for defamation. The American Psychiatric Association, so if you're a mental health professional, came up with a principle that said, do not diagnose any public figure. Okay? Um, and I would say to you, be careful who you call a narcissist, because I will deal with anybody's anger in the world. I'll deal with a borderline's anger. You can look at me like, what, are you crazy? Before I'll ever deal with a narcissist's anger, because a narcissist will annihilate you. They, they, they don't just want to, like, hurt you and then come back and say, I'm sorry. They, they want to destroy you. So be very careful. Now, there is currently, so that's the Goldwater rule. There is currently debate, I'll let you assume why, um, in my profession in terms of whether we as mental health professionals should speak up when we see a notable figure that is a narcissist speaking to the potential dangers of what might happen if we put narcissists in certain positions. So there is a debate in our field, whether we follow the Goldwater rule, nope, don't do it. Other people say, no, 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 we need to speak up. So does that help answer the question? Okay, great. 
any other comments? So you said um, if there, like if you have someone nurses within your life, you can just be boring or uninvolved. What if I have a friend? What if her son and her husband are both nurses? Yeah. It's very hard. She can't be uninvolved and boring the whole time. She, she can't. She can't. She's in a very difficult situation. You know, I would explain to her the wounds in the process. I would surround her with great support. Know that in terms of um, the... the uh, bi-directional nature of the love that she longs for and um, um, in the relationship isn't going to occur and help her find other places that she can get that. When possible, if she can be rather gray rocking, boring, um, those individuals who are narcissistic then might go seek that, get that affirmation elsewhere and become less reliant upon her. But leaving a narcissistic relationship is extremely difficult and problematic. And there's, there are a handful of podcasts. Uh, there's one that recently came out um, a couple months back. Um, Evelyn, oh no, Evan Rachel Wood was uh, in a long-term relationship with a rock star. You can check it out. And she very candidly talked about her experience. And it was really quite vi vivid with uh, uh, Dr. Romani. Um, I can't remember Dr. Romani's last name. Um, but that's what I would advise. It's very hard. So that she would get outside support and help. Okay. Yep, go ahead. Um, is narcissism strictly like a learned behavior or personality trait, or can it also be hereditary? Great question. Do you have graduate school on the mind? No, I don't even go here. I was just interested. <laughs> um, you know, um, surprisingly, um, in, in, the, in the things that I've read, there is a high evidence to show that narcissism is genetic. Um, you, you see it in the family trees. So bad news is it's, it, it does seem to have a cluster in, in the gene pool. When you understand epigenetics, epigenetics are the things in the environment that turn genes on or off. You can never get outside the whole nature and nurture question. But we do know that narcissists seem to, to, seem to come from environments that are either overindulgent or extremely underindulgent. Um, if you ever want to get fascinated by... Sigmund Freud's childhood, read about his childhood, and particularly his relationship with his mother. Now, some of you are professors are laughing like, oh my gosh, yeah, check it out. Um, clearly older, uh, uh, overindulgent. His mother called him Golden Siggy. Okay, story is, is that he was upset once. Uh, they, his, his next younger sister's Anna, and you, you know, he's got a daughter named Anna, but he was very clear that he did not name his daughter after his sister, went public with that. He named it after his, his mentor's wife, okay, who happened to be Anna. But the Freuds bought a piano for his sister that was right under him. He was so annoyed by it, he said, get rid of that piano. Mommy got rid of the piano. So that's overindulgent. Now, I'm not saying that he's <laughs> breaking the Goldwater rule. He's a narcissist, but one has to wonder. Uh, and and on, on the other side is people who get no affirmation. So what they do then is they overcompensate. So the two extremes, the, the, there's some dynamics in parental relationships, too, that they look at, um, controlling, overly affirming, unaffirming, et cetera. Does that help? So but genetics, yes. So right. question over here. Um, hello. I would just like to know, um, because, like, you mentioned something about, like, like, the difference between, like, a person who's, like, a narcissist and, are, like, artistic. I like to know, like, for, like, those people who are, like, not of, like, the psychology, like, background, um, from your point of view, how could you, like, identify, or how could, like, anyone, like, identify, like, a person who's, like, autistic or, like, a, nar or, like, a narcissist, or if, like, if the person's, like, a high-functioning autistic, is it a possibility that autism and narcissism could overlap with each other. Yeah, here, they, yes, they can. Here's, the, uh, I guess, the bad news on that. Uh, narcissism and autism can co-occur. Um, so, you know, I would argue to say, I don't know the prevalence on it, but I would say it's extremely rare. But there's no indication that I know of that would say that they're mutually exclusive. So they can co-occur. The difference that I would say between those individuals who are narcissistic and those individuals who are autistic 
is what I, that slide that I that I put up there. The anxiety that they experience when someone is in emotional ex, um, distress is that they don't know what to do. There's a want to be there for the other person. Um, so even if, even if they have sensory issues, and you, you say to the autistic, can you hug them? They go, oh, no, 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 I can't hug. I can't hug, it's, it's too hard. Well, that's anxiety over the sensory issues. That's not an unwillingness to want to be there. Well, can you say to them, I'm sorry you're hurt. Yes, I'm sorry you're hurt. They, they, they will go forward. With it. In my work with those people on the spectrum, it felt to me like if I was a computer programmer, I felt like I was creating coding for autistic individuals. What do I mean by that? Okay. You, your wife wants flowers. Yes, yeah, she wants flowers. Okay. Where's her favorite flower shop? Downtown Barrington. Okay. Can you drive by there on the way to work? No, it's out of the way. Drive by there on the way to work or on the way home from work. They go, okay, I'll drive by there. But it's not on the way to work. It doesn't make sense. Why would I go that way? I know, just trust me because it's really important to her. Walk in the store. Ask, what's your wife's favorite flower? A rose. Ask, what color rose? A pink one. Go in, the, find, a, find an attendant, ask them for a pink rose. Literally, I'm spelling out, drive over there, walk in the store, ask for a pink rose. Buy 12 dozen pink roses. Write a note that says, I love you. Literally, I'm going like this. And, the, the, and, and they'll do this. They will very willingly do this. They will do this with great pride and joy. And the spouses will say to me, thank you. Thank you. He just needed the instructions. She might say something like, eh, it feels a little kind of, you know, step by step. But she felt positive. But you can feel the want to. They just need to know how to do it. And for most of us, we go like, well, no brainer, right? But to an autist, they're, they're, they, they lack the mirroring neurons, where I would argue to say that, that narcissists have the mirroring neurons to really read the other person well. You know mirroring neurons, you probably learned that in psychology, that I can identify what you're feeling because I have a similar pattern in my own brain. It resonates uh, a mirroring part of my brain as you experience it. So I can step in and say, my gosh, I'm feeling so sad too. You're so sad. Oh my gosh, you're I'm feeling it too. Those are the mirroring neurons. Does that help? Go ahead. Uh, I have a similar question to that. Um, so what if someone who was on the autistic spectrum saw like the, had it all spelled out, like the situation for them, like a few, uh, go comfort this person. But what if they just didn't want to? Like they didn't feel any empathy for that person. Would you say that they exhibit both autistic and narcissistic traits? They could. I don't know. I'd want to dive into it uh, further. The one thing I didn't say when I was talking about when we diagnose narcissism, we need to take it very, very, very slowly. This is not a diagnosis that I will make quickly. If someone comes in and sits on my couch and they already have that diagnosis, but there are a lot of reasons why at moments in time we won't empathize. And it doesn't, it, it has to be chronic and pervasive. I have to see it in numerous people and I have to see it across time. It could be that that um, person on the spectrum has a hard time um, empathizing with this person because it reminded them of a bully when they were in junior high. Um, and you could say that that's a narcissistic defense, but you, you see what I'm saying? So what, what I would do is I would sit down with a professional and really have them diagnose it. But for it to be truly diagnosable, it has to have that hallmark to be chronic and pervasive. Okay. Hi. Um, nice Nixon impression, by the way. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I want us to uh, get, get some more detail because I understand that some narcissists are born because of um, getting too much spotlight yeah. that you mentioned. Um, I wanted to confirm that it works both ways, right? Where even if the child isn't getting enough yes. spotlight, that they still could still be, you know, become a narcissist. Yes. Yes, they can. In fact, I'm, I'm going to give you some bad news. Okay. Um, I, I, I believe that normal people, I said normal, correction, usual and customary people <laughs> um, can develop narcissism. 
Yeah, if I've seen it where, and in, in, in small situations, small instances, in cases where someone is all of a sudden thrust into the limelight, and if you knew them when they were in high school, they were incredibly empathic, incredibly caring, etc. And all of a sudden, all this fame has gone to us, what we would say, head, and they become full-blown narcissists. So the, 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 the beauty as therapists is that we're constantly changing. And it's the people around us and the context around us that are changing us. That works negatively and that works positively. So in this sense, yeah, you can develop narcissism later in life. And never, but, but I've already said it's genetic and you have kind of the, the belief that it's, it's either on one of those two, two extremes. So, thank you. Great question. Wrapping up? Yeah, I think that's going to be con the conclusion of our program. Uh, you have any other questions? Sarah Williams might say a few words, and I think uh, we have a, something for you to as well. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you all for coming. I wanted to thank you for the awesome presentation, and um, I hope you all have a good day. We have a little something for you as well.